We're gonna see time pressure, brilliant moves, and big turnarounds in these games. They don't understand how to play it safe. One is notorious for getting his opponent into time trouble and playing a little bit too quickly himself. He is the two-time winner of the candidates tournament, an incredible feat. It's Jan Napomniachi of Russia. His opponent, in addition to just playing crazy lines because, you know, it's fun, it's gonna make a bit of a masterpiece, he's got a spectacular wardrobe, Levon Aronian. They are playing in the 2023 Generational Cup. It's part of a series put on by Chess.com. That means two really important things. One, it's got a big prize fund, so you've got all these really, really good players. And two, it's played on the computer. There's a three second delay. That's gonna become really important here. Okay, game one of this match, the time format is 15 minutes per player with a three second delay. You can see Aronian, he's playing the black pieces. He just gives up his bishop pair over to Nepo. And after the development, we see that Aronian, he's giving up both bishops. So we have two bishops versus two knights. We have a bit of an imbalance. This move by Aronian, this forces a response by white. He is threatening this pawn to fork the queen and the bishop. And Nepo doesn't really have a great response to it. He could, of course, you know, recapture this pawn, but that would create isolated doubled pawns here on the C file. That's not going to be really, really that great for him. And if he pushes, let's say he pushes this pawn right here to E4 himself, this capture right here here is going to have the same thing. The knight is right here, so you'd be giving up your bishop. You'd be opening up some discoveries with this rook. It's just a little bit too risky, so he has to move backwards. And Aronian, he pushes forward, and he locks these pawns. So these pawns are locked here in the center. It creates a closed position, which maybe makes those knights a little bit better than the bishops. And after this trade, then Nepo, he's got a backwards pawn here on c3, and Aronian, he slices his knight right there. He prevents that from moving forward. He is giving Nepo the option of capturing, recapturing. Now he's got this protected pass pawn, but it's giving up that bishop pair, and the remaining bishop would be this dark bishop, so maybe not the world's best idea. And so as the game progresses over here, we have this really cool rook lift by Aronian. He is um, potentially thinking about bringing his rook over to bear here and he's also thinking that he's going to be able to you know maybe get over here or maybe even push this b6 pawn which is what he does so the rooks move forward and now we're doubling up here on the c file aronian if this knight moves eventually he's going to be bearing down on this backwards weak pawn yanni gives up his bishop for the knight and now we see that he is just completely abandoning this c3 pawn. And why is he abandoning it? His other choice is, you know, maybe he could defend this way, but that's going to be a really passive bishop. It's also going to cut off this rook from the game. And so he decides to go with a more active approach. He gives that up. He gets his bishop outside of the pawn chain. And he's thinking, well, you know, maybe I've got my own checkmate threats on the horizon. So Levon, he moves back. His knight is defending that critical g7 square this g6 it would typically be a weakening mood he's got all of his pawns here on light squares he does not have a dark squared bishop to you know cover up these holes but this knight is pretty ideally placed to cover that up and he has other ideas in mind he pushes here to h5 he doesn't really care too much it just seems like about weakening his own king he wants to like you know get a little bit get a little bit aggressive and he pushes g5 he really really doesn't care and what's the reason for that the reason is that he's got such a space advantage we've got the center lock both of these rooks are outside of the game and so even if you know somehow Jan can get through these defenses he just doesn't have enough pieces to affect a you know a good attack and he moves over here to e5 he's trying to you know keep that pressure up this Brilliant move here by Levon. He is threatening this bishop. He's pushing it back. And you might be thinking, you know, well, what about this pawn right here? That's part of the reason that Jan moved his queen to e5. So what happens if this 
rook just captures this pawn. Well, that's exactly what gets played in the game. He is counterattacking the queen, so what's more valuable than a bishop? This queen is more valuable, but in this position, there is actually only one move. You might think, okay, cool, I gotta sidestep my queen. You know, what happens, you know, if I move over here to c8? Well, you're gonna be losing defense of this g5 pawn. That's gonna come with check. That's not gonna be good enough. So, okay, cool, so I have to maintain defense here. You know, well, I can potentially move my queen here to f6, but now I'm losing sight of this knight. So I have to maintain semblance of the knight and the pawn here. So you might be thinking, okay, cool. Well, let me just move my rook over here and block the attack. Well, it doesn't quite work out because there's too many pieces holding onto that d6 square. So the only move here that is going to work for Levon to keep his advantage is capturing this bishop. Well, <laughs> what's going on here? Well, the whole idea being you cannot capture the queen here because you are now threatening checkmate here on the back rank. This really, really cool in-between move. And Levon, he goes up a piece. Jan has to recapture here with g3 because, you know, if you recapture with the queen, then you're going to be, you know, losing this rook. So now he has a little bit more damage structure. And now we're able to sidestep. He's giving up that pawn with check. And Levon, he brings his rook over. He's got pressure along that g file. And he's moving his knight forward, trying to gain more space. And this rook to d3 move might seem a little bit weird, but he's actually threatening right now to win the e3 pawn. The idea being, you know, queen to c1, and now I'm double attacking e3. Jan steps back, and with this rook to d1 move, there's a lot of threats here in the air. It doesn't quite work yet, but this move, and if you recapture here, which you know, otherwise you're giving up your queen you're opening up the king that way. It looks really, really scary. And so Jan feels compelled to capture this knight, give up the exchange there. And now he is trying to get some sort of a repetitive check, move some stuff around. After all these trades happen, Levon, he's left with only three pawns left. And honestly, more importantly, 25 seconds left on the clock. This is one of Jan's best strengths is pushing his clock advantage, moving instantly, basically not thinking since he's able to calculate so, so quickly. Let's see what he's able to do. He technically is at a bit of a disadvantage still since he's down a piece, but is Levon going to be able to figure out what to do with his king in the middle of the board? Nowhere really to hide, and those pawns that are still very, very weak. Well, we see in just a couple of moves, he loses another pawn, and a couple moves later, he loses another pawn. We have equal material. Levon's got nine seconds left. He gets three extra seconds per move. Let's see what Jan does. He starts pushing his pawns forward. He parts pushing his king forward. That little cocoon is moving forward. And now the king bravely moves forward. This g4 square, there's actually no checks. Um, These two squares are taken by the pawns. And so there's nowhere for his queen to make progress. And Jan is able to force a queen trade. The king moves over. And what is the rook going to be able to do? Is he going to be able to stop all of these pawns? They're already fairly far advanced. The pawn moves up to the sixth rank and seventh rank. And it's just going to be too much. A couple more moves later, we have two pawns along the seventh rank. One of these is going to be a queen. And right here, Levon resigns. The first game goes to Jan. This is a four-game match. Let's see if Levon's able to strike back here in the second game. Let's see what he's able to do. We have Jan playing the Petrov defense here as black. He is a specialist in that. He plays that all the time. He's probably the leading expert on the Petrov. We have here, in a couple moves, he trades off his knight for Levon's knight. He forces damaged pawns here. Um, and, but he did spend one, two, three moves to do that versus, you know, the one move from Levon. Levon now has both of his bishops available to enter the game. So it's got its trade-offs to it. We have Levon having some natural development here. 
We have Kingside versus Queenside Castle. He's not interested in a draw. He's playing for a win. He's playing for chaos. He gets all of his pieces right here in the center. This looks really, really cool. We got both rooks just plowing down the middle of the board. Let's see what he's able to make happen. He pushes here, and now he has two sets of doubles pawns. These ones are isolated. They're very weak, but he's got this open G file that he's going to be able to start exploiting. Jan pushes forward, and then Levon, he pushes H4. It's not a move I really would have considered. I would have just gotten over to G1, but, you know, wh whatever. And now Jan, he gets back. He needs to defend this G7 square, potentially. Now we get the G1 move. The king moves over. We keep pushing that pawn. It looks like, okay, cool, we're going to be able to take that. But now you'd be opening up the H file, so it looks really scary to do so. Also, we got both these push-ups already plowing down here on the king side. So you really don't want to open that up if you don't have to. We push forward. We have to make that weakening move. All pawn moves are basically weakening moves. And we have this rook lift. Maybe he is thinking about grabbing this pawn. Let's see. We push. We force the rook to make a decision. He does capture that pawn. And now we have the queen being attacked. And with this kind of, you know, lock setup right here, this rook is looking mighty misplaced. And so Jan, he solves both those problems with one move. He gives an exchange sacrifice. It's mostly a defensive exchange sacrifice. He only needs to get a draw in this game to keep his advantage in the match. And now we see Levon, he doubles up along the G file. He's still got his bishop. He's still got his queen pointing this way. We've got even material. And if this gets to an end game, Levon, he's got, you know, the rooks are bigger than the other pieces. So let's see what he's able to make happen. We have this F3 move. It looks super, super mysterious. And for this move, after queen F3, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe you can do something insane like, you know, capturing here. And then when you recapture, you know, this is open. I don't know. I couldn't really quite figure it out. Uh, the computer's saying you go here and now you pin this. Um, you're, cap you're attacking this. It's just complete insanity. Um, you know, instead of that after here, what the computer's saying is, you know, just move your rook over and you're lined up against the knight. That's a much easier solution for it. Um, none of that happens. Instead of queen captures, the queen, it's in a bit of a precarious position. If we're able to get a rook over to the H file and line up here it, and it moves, this pawn's going to fall. Right now, the bishop is covering the H2 square. Um, but that could all change here really, really quickly. This move is really mysterious to me. I figure, well, you know, the queen can capture or the bishop can capture. Both seem totally fine to me. Um, what ends up happening in the game is the queen captures. And now the queen steps back. I don't know if that was just a clearance to get the queen off of the H file. These guys are super, super good at chess sets, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna trust them. Rook moves over to e2. The queen moves to b6. It seems like the queen's kind of abandoning the king, and the white attack might be able to break through. We're lining up along the h file now. The king steps forward, a3, rook to e1. Levon wants to keep pieces on the board. He's got everything on light squares, so that black bishop can't attack it. Right now, he is threatening queen captures here because, you know, we've got a pin right there. So that needs to be addressed. Addresses it this way. Queen moves forward. And we are re-upping the threat of this capture. We can capture here and then recapture, capture. So what's going to happen? The bishop moves out of the way. Queen moves forward. The white bishop is chased away. It moves forward. And Nebu, he's putting up some major pressure right now. He is moving all of his pieces forward. Levon is running out of space. And the king is somehow completely safe here on g7. Let's see what Levon's do. Is he able to make something happen? We can see he is down on time again this game. It is Jan's superpower. And this h5 move is, again, weakening. You know, it's getting rid of some of the defenses in front of that black king. But Levon is getting more and more space. The rook moves forward. The queen has to move back, running out of even more room. 
This queen g1 move would indirectly defend this bishop due to the pin. So the game continues. We move over that way. The king tries to get out of some of the pressure. This bishop is moving back. It's a weird spot. It's no longer in an attacking position. And Levon, he's trying to make something happen, but we can see the screws. How safe is this white king now? Well, when this c pawn falls and this fork falls it really isn't that safe at all we have these three pieces attacking only these two are defending jan is up a lot of material already this game is over jan goes up two nothing in this match there's two more games left let's see if levon's able to pull something off third game of this match jan he's got the white pieces he just needs a draw in order to secure a win in the match he goes with the alipin sicilian that's got a lot of drawish tendencies let's see if levon's able to create chances in this game we can see some trades levon he's accepted an isolated c pawn he's trying to open up he's got that open b file and if you notice here um we have this open b file um but we have levon he's shooting down over on the king side and so Jan's a total psycho. He castles queenside anyway, even though he knows that all he needs is a draw. And he accepts these damaged pawns as well. He's going also for an attack. He's playing h4. He brings his queen over and forces this queen trade. This trade is pretty much forced as well. And we can see that each of those trades is going to favor Jan for the match. We have bishops of opposite color, and it's just not enough. Jan's able to win this with a commanding two and a half to one half. Um, this doesn't happen every time. Levon, he's beaten basically all the best players in the world. I'm going to be showcasing more and more of his games. And this is the Jan you're going to see in the upcoming candidates tournament. He won in commanding style the last two go rounds let's see what some of his challenges are able to do if you're interested in who he's going to be playing against and seeing some of that coverage please consider subscribing i'll see you here next week have a great night i'll see you around soon